Crowley's London flat was the epitome of style. It was everything that a flat should be. Spacious, white, elegantly furnished, and with that designer unlived-in look, which only comes from not being lived in. This is because Crowley did not live there. It was simply the place he went back to at the end of the day when he was in London. The beds were always made. The fridge was always stocked with gourmet food that never went off. That was why Crowley had a fridge, after all. And for that matter, the fridge never needed to be defrosted or even plugged in. The lounge contained a huge television, a white leather sofa, a video and a laser disc player, an answer phone, two telephones, the answer phone line and the private line, a number so far undiscovered by the legions of telephone salesmen who persisted in trying to sell Crowley double glazing, which he already had, or life insurance, which he didn't need, and a square matte black sound system, the kind so exquisitely engineered that it was just had the on and off switch and the volume control. The only sound equipment Crowley had overlooked was speakers. He had forgotten about them. Not that it made any difference. The sound reproduction was quite perfect anyway. There was an unconnected fax machine with the intelligence of a computer and a computer with the intelligence of a retarded ant. Nevertheless, Crowley upgraded it every few months because a sleek computer was the sort of thing Crowley felt that the sort of human he tried to be would have. This one was like a Porsche with a screen. The manuals were still in their transparent wrapping, along with the standard computer warranty agreement which said that if the machine, one, didn't work, two, didn't do what the expensive advertisements said, three, electrocuted the immediate neighbourhood, four, and in fact failed entirely to be inside the expensive box when you opened it. This was expressly, absolutely, implicitly, and in no event the fault or responsibility of the manufacturer. That the purchaser should consider himself lucky to be allowed to give his money to the manufacturer, and that any attempts to treat what had just been paid for as the purchaser's own property would result in the attentions of serious men with menacing briefcases and very thin watches. Crowley had been extremely impressed with the warranties offered by the computer industry and had in fact sent a bundle below into the department that drew up the Immortal Soul Agreements with a yellow memo form attached just saying, Learn, guys. In fact, the only things in the flat Crowley devoted any personal attention to were the houseplants. They were huge and green and glorious, with shiny, healthy, lustrous leaves. This was because once a week, Crowley went around the flat with a green plastic plant mister, spraying the leaves and talking to the plants. He had heard about talking to plants in the early 70s on Radio 4 and thought it an excellent idea, although talking is perhaps the wrong word for what Crowley did. What he did was put the fear of God into them, more precisely, the fear of Crowley. In addition to which, every couple of months, Crowley would pick out a plant that was growing too slowly or succumbing to leaf wilt or browning or just didn't look quite as good as the others and he would carry it around to all the other plants. Say goodbye to your friend, he'd say to them. He just couldn't cut it. Then he would leave the flat with the offending plant and return an hour or so later with a large empty plastic flower pot which he would leave somewhere conspicuously around the flat. The plants were the most luxurious, verdant and beautiful in London, also the most terrified. The lounge was lit by spotlights and white neon tubes of the kind one casually props against a chair or a corner. The only wall decoration was a framed drawing. The cartoon for the Mona Lisa, Leonardo da Vinci's original sketch. Crowley had bought it from the artist one hot afternoon in Florence and felt it was superior to the final painting. Leonardo had felt so too. I got her bloody smile right in the roughs, he said to Crowley, sipping cold wine in the lunchtime sun, but it went all over the place when I painted it. Her husband had a few things to say about it when I delivered it, but like I tell him, Signor del Giacondo, apart from you, who's going to see it? Anyway, explain this helicopter thing again, would you? 
Crowley had a bedroom and a kitchen and an office and a lounge and a toilet. Each room forever clean and perfect. He had spent an uncomfortable time in each of these rooms during the long wait for the end of the world. He had phoned his operatives in the Witchfinder Army again to try to get news. But his contact, Sergeant Shadwell, had just gone out and the dim-witted receptionist seemed unable to grasp that he was willing to speak to any of the others. Mr Pulsifer is out too, love, she told him. He went down to Tadfield this morning on a mission. I'll speak to anyone, Crowley had explained. I'll tell Mr Shadwell that, she had said, when he gets back. Now, if you don't mind, it's one of my mornings, and I can't leave my gentleman like that for too long or he'll catch his death. And at two, I've got Mrs Ormerod and Mr Scroggy and young Julia coming over for a sitting, and there's the place to clean and all beforehand. But I'll give Mr Shadwell your message. Crowley gave up. He tried to read a novel, but couldn't concentrate. He tried to sort his CDs into alphabetical order, but gave up when he discovered they already were in alphabetical order, as was his bookcase and his collection of soul music. He was very proud of his collection. It had taken him ages to put together. This was real soul music. James Brown wasn't in it. Eventually, he settled down on the white leather sofa and gestured at the television. Reports are coming in, said a worried newcaster. Um, reports are, well, nobody seems to know what's going on, but reports available to us would seem to uh, indicate an increase in international tensions that would have undoubtedly been viewed as impossible this time last week, when uh, everyone seemed to be getting on so nicely. Uh, this would seem at least partly due to the spate of unusual events which have occurred over the last few days. Off the coast of Japan, Crowley... Yes, admitted Crowley. What the hell is going on, Crowley? What exactly have you been doing? Uh, how do you mean? Crowley asked, although he already knew. The boy, called Warlock. We have brought him to the fields of Megiddo. The dog is not with him. The child knows nothing of the great war. He is not our master's son. Ah, said Crowley. Is that all you can say, Crowley? Our troops are assembled. The four beasts have begun to ride, but where are they riding to? Something has gone wrong, Crowley, and it is your responsibility and, in all probability, your fault. We trust you have a perfectly reasonable explanation for all this. Oh, yes, agreed Crowley readily. Perfectly reasonable. Because you are going to have your chance to explain it all to us. You are going to have all the time there is to explain. And we will listen with great interest to everything you have to say. And your conversation, and the circumstances that will accompany it, will provide a source of entertainment and pleasure for all the damned of hell, Crowley. Because no matter how racked with torment, no matter what agonies the lowest of the damned are suffering, Crowley, you will have it worse. With a gesture, Crowley turned the set off. The dull grey-green screen continued enunciating. The silence formed itself into words. Do not even think about trying to escape us, Crowley. There is no escape. Stay where you are. You will be collected. Crowley went to the window and looked out. Something black and car-shaped was moving slowly down the street towards him. It was car-shaped enough to fool the casual observer. Crowley, who was observing very carefully, noticed that not only were the wheels not going round, but they weren't even attached to the car. It was slowing down as it passed each house. Crowley assumed that the car's passengers, neither of them would be driving, neither of them knew how, were peering out at the house numbers. He had a little time. Crowley went into the kitchen and got a plastic bucket from under the sink. Then he went back into the lounge. The infernal authorities had ceased communicating. Crowley turned the television to the wall, just in case. He walked over to the Mona Lisa. Crowley lifted the picture down from the wall, revealing a safe. It was not a wall safe. It had been brought from a company that specialised in servicing the nuclear industry. He unlocked it, revealing an inner door with a dial combination lock. He spun the dial. 4004 was the number, easy to remember. The year he had slithered onto this stupid, marvellous planet, back when it was gleaming and new. 
Inside the safe were a thermos flask, two heavy PVC gloves of the kind that covered one's entire arms, and some tongs. Crowley paused. He eyed the flask nervously. There was a crash from downstairs. That had been the front door. He pulled on the gloves and gingerly took the flask and the tongs and the bucket, and as an afterthought he grabbed the plant mister from beside a, a luxuriant rubber plant and headed for his office walking like a man carrying a thermos flask full of something that might cause, if he dropped it or even thought about dropping it, the sort of explosion that impels greybeards to make statements like and where this crater is now once stood the city of Washington in SFB movies. He reached his office, nudged open the door with his shoulder. Then he bent his legs and slowly put things down on the floor. Bucket, tongs, plant mister and finally, deliberately, the flask. A bead of sweat began to form on Crowley's forehead and trickled down into one eye he flicked it away. Then, with care and deliberation, he used the tongs to unscrew the top of the flask. Carefully, carefully. That was it. A pounding on the stairs below him and a muffled scream. That would have been the little old lady on the floor below. He could not afford to rush. He gripped the flask with the tongs and, taking care not to spill the tiniest drop, he poured the contents into the plastic bucket. One false move was all it would take. There. Then he opened the office door about six inches and placed the bucket on top. He used the tongs to replace the top of the flask, then a crash from his outer hallway. Pulled off the PVC gloves, picked up the plant mister and settled himself behind his desk. Crawley, called a guttural voice. Haster, he's through there, hissed another voice. I can feel the slimy little creep. Liger, Haster and Liger. Now, as Crowley would be the first to protest, most demons weren't deep down evil. In the great cosmic game, they felt they occupied the same position as tax inspectors, doing an unpopular job, maybe, but essential to the overall operation of the whole thing. If it came to that, some angels weren't paragons of virtue. Crowley had met one or two who, when it came to righteously smiting the ungodly, smote a good deal harder than was strictly necessary. On the whole, everyone had a job to do, and just did it. And on the other hand... You got people like Liger and Haster who took such a dark delight in unpleasantness you might even have mistaken them for human. Crowley leaned back in his executive chair. He forced himself to relax and failed utterly. In here, people, he called. We want a word with you, said Liger, in a tone of voice intended to imply that word was synonymous with horrifically painful eternity. And the squat demon pushed open the office door. The bucket teetered, then fell neatly on Liger's head. Drop a lump of sodium in water. Watch it flame and burn and spin around crazily, flaring and sputtering. This was like that, just nastier. The demon peeled and flared and flickered. Oily brown smoke oozed from it and it screamed and it screamed and it screamed. Then it crumpled, folded in on itself and what was left lay glistening on the burnt and blackened circle of carpet, looking like a handful of mashed slugs. Hi, said Crowley to Haster, who had been walking behind Liga and had unfortunately not been so much as splashed. There are some things that are unthinkable. There are some depths that not even demons believe other demons would stoop to. Holy water! You bastard, said Haster, you complete bastard. He hadn't ever done nothing to you. Yet, corrected Crowley, who felt a little more comfortable. Now the odds were closer to even. Closer, but not yet even, not by a long shot. Haster was a duke of hell. Crowley wasn't even a local councillor. Your fate will be whispered by mothers in dark places to frighten their young, said Haster, and then felt that the language of hell wasn't up to the job. You're going to get taken to the bloody cleaners, pal, he said. Crowley raised the green plastic plant mister and sloshed it around threateningly. Go away, he said. He heard the phone downstairs ringing four times and then the answer phone caught it. He wondered vaguely who it was. 
You don't frighten me, said Hasta. He watched a drop of water leak from the nozzle and slide slowly down the side of the plastic container toward Crowley's hand. Do you know what this is, said Crowley? This is a Sainsbury's plant mister, cheapest and most efficient plant mister in the world. It can squirt a fine spray of water into the air. Do I need to tell you what's in it? It could turn you into that. He pointed to the mess on the carpet. Now go away. Then the drip on the side of the plant mister reached Curly's curled fingers and stopped. You're bluffing, said Hasta. Maybe I am, said Crowley in a tone of voice which he hoped made it quite clear that bluffing was the last thing on his mind. And maybe I'm not. Do you feel lucky? Hasta gestured and the plastic bulb dissolved like rice paper, spilling water all over Crowley's desk and all over Crowley's suit. Yes, said Hasta, and then he smiled. His teeth were too sharp and his tongue flickered between them. Do you? Crowley said nothing. Plan A had worked, plan B had failed, everything depended on plan C. And there was one drawback to this. He had only ever planned as far as B. So, hissed Hasta, time to go, Crowley. I think there's something you ought to know, said Crowley, stalling for time. And that is, smiled Hasta. Then the phone on Crowley's desk rang. He picked it up and warned Hasta, don't move. There's something very important you should know and I really mean it. Hello? Mm, said Crowley. Then he said, nah, got an old friend here. Aziraphale hung up. Crowley wondered what he had wanted. And suddenly plan C was there in his head. He didn't replace the handset on the receiver. Instead, he said, OK, Hasta, you've passed the test. You're ready to start playing with the big boys. Have you gone mad? Nope. Don't you understand? This was a test. The Lords of Hell had to know that you were trustworthy before we gave you command of the legions of the damned in the war ahead. Crowley, you are lying or you are insane or possibly you are both, said Hasta, but his certainty was shaken. Just for a moment he had entertained the possibility. That was where Crowley had got him. It was just possible that Hell was testing him, that Crowley was more than he seemed. Hasta was paranoid, which was simply a sensible and well-adjusted reaction to living in hell, where they really were all out to get you. Crowley began to dial a number. It's OK, Duke Hasta. I wouldn't expect you to believe it from me, he admitted. But why don't we talk to the Dark Council? I'm sure that they can convince you. The number he had dialed clicked and started to ring. So long, sucker, he said, and vanished. In a tiny fraction of a second, Hasta was gone as well. Over the years, a huge number of theological man-hours have been spent debating the famous question, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? In order to arrive at an answer, the following facts must be taken into consideration. Firstly, angels simply don't dance. It's one of the distinguishing characteristics that marks an angel. They may listen appreciatively to the music of the spheres, but they don't feel the urge to get down and boogie to it. So, none. At least, nearly none. Aziraphale had learned to gavotte in a discreet gentleman's club in Portland Place in the late 1880s. And while he had initially taken to it like a duck to merchant banking, after a while he had become quite good at it and was quite put out when, some decades later, the gavotte went out of style for good. So, providing the dance was a gavotte, and providing that he had a suitable partner, also able, for the sake of argument, both to gavotte and to dance it on the head of a pin, the answer is a straightforward one. Then again, you might just as well ask how many demons can dance on the head of a pin. They're of the same original stock, after all and at least they dance. Although it's not what you and I would call dancing. Not good dancing anyway. A demon moves like the British group in the Eurovision Song Contest. And if you put it that way, the answer is quite a lot actually, providing they abandon their physical bodies, which is a picnic for a demon. Demons aren't bound by physics. If you take the long view, the universe is just something small and round, like those water-filled balls which produce a miniature snowstorm when you shake them. 
Although, unless the ineffable plan is a lot more ineffable than it's given credit for, it does not have a giant plastic snowman at the bottom. But if you look from really close up, the only problem about dancing on the head of a pin is all those big gaps between electrons. For those of angel stock or demon breed, size and shape and composition are simply options. Crowley is currently travelling incredibly fast down a telephone line. Ring! Crowley went through two telephone exchanges at a very respectable fraction of light speed. Haster was a little way behind him, four or five inches, but at that size it gave Crowley a very comfortable lead. One that would vanish, of course, when he came out the other end. They were too small for sound, but demons don't necessarily need sound to communicate. He could hear Hasta screaming behind him, You bastard, I'll get you, you can't escape me! Ring! Wherever you come out, I'll come out too, you won't get away! Crowley had travelled through over 20 miles of cable in less than a second. Hasta was close behind him. Crowley was going to have to time this whole thing very, very carefully. Ring! That was the third ring. Well, thought Crowley, here goes nothing. He stopped suddenly and watched Hasta shoot past him. He turned and, ring! Crowley shot out through the phone line, zapped through the plastic sheathing and materialised full size and out of breath in his lounge. Click! The outgoing message tape began to turn on his answer phone. Then there was a beep, and as the incoming message tape turned, a voice from the speaker screamed after the beep, Right! What? You bloody snake! The little red message light began to flash, on and off and on and off, like a tiny red angry eye. Crowley really wished he had some more holy water and the time to hold the cassette in it until it dissolved. But getting hold of Liger's terminal bath had been dangerous enough. He'd had it for years just in case, and even its presence in the room made him uneasy. Or... Or maybe, yes, what would happen if he put the cassette in the car? He could play Hasta over and over again until he turned into Freddie Mercury. No, he might be a bastard, but you could only go so far. There was a rumble of distant thunder. He had no time to spare. He had nowhere to go. He went anyway. He ran down to his Bentley and drove towards the West End as if all the demons of hell were after him, which was, more or less, the case. The Old Song by G.K. Chesterton A livid sky on London, and like the iron steeds that rear, a shock of engines halted, and I knew the end was near. And something said that far away, over the hills and far away, there came a crawling thunder and the end of all things here. For London Bridge is broken down, broken down, broken down, as digging lets the daylight on the sunken streets of yore. The lightning looked on London town, the broken bridge of London town, the ending of a broken road where men shall go no more. I saw the kings of London town, the kings that buy and sell, that built it up with penny loaves and penny lies as well. And where the streets were paved with gold, the shriveled paper shone for gold, the scorching light of promises that paved the streets of hell. For penny loaves will melt away, melt away, melt away, mock the men that haggled in the grain they did not grow. With hungry faces in the gate, a hundred thousand in the gate, a thunder flash on London, and the finding of the foe. I heard the hundred pin-makers slow down their racking din, till in the stillness men could hear the dropping of the pin. And somewhere men, without the wall, beneath the wood without the wall, had found the place where London ends and England can begin. For pins and needles bend and break, bend and break, bend and break faster than the breaking spears or the bending of the bow, of pageants pale in thunderlight, twixt thunder load and thunder light, the hundreds marching on the hills in the wars of long ago. I saw great Cobbett riding the horsemen of the shires, and his face was red with judgment and a light of Luddite fires. 
And south to Sussex and the sea, the lights leapt up for liberty, the trumpet of the yeomanry, the hammer of the squires. For bars of iron rust away, rust away, rust away, rend before the hammer and the horsemen riding in, crying that all men at the last, and at the worst, and at the last, have found the place where England ends and England can begin. His horse hoofs go beyond you, far beyond your bursting tyres, and time is bridged behind him, and our sons are with our sires. A trailing meteor on the downs he rides above the rotting towns, the horseman of apocalypse, the rider of the shires. For London Bridge is broken down, broken down, broken down. Blow the horn of Huntingdon from Scotland to the sea. Only flash of thunderlight, a flying dream of thunderlight, had shown under the shattered sky a people that were free. The Kraken by Alfred Lord Tennyson Below the thunders of the upper deep, Far, far beneath in the abysmal sea, His ancient, dreamless, uninvaded sleep The kraken sleepeth. Faintest sunlights flee about his shadowy sides. Above him swell huge sponges Of millennial growth and height. And far away into the sickly light, From many a wondrous grot and secret cell, Unnumbered and enormous polypi Winnow with giant fins the slumbering green. There hath he lain for ages, and will lie battening upon huge sea-worms in his sleep, until the latter fire shall heat the deep. Then once by men and angels to be seen, in roaring he shall rise, and on the surface die. Strange, there was never a dream. 
Just a 